the county sheriff's department deputy um, here in the East Bay. And we have Hassan Elahai, uh, an artist and professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, and we have Shinyeri Tatashunde, who works at the Center for Media Justice. Um, we'll be talking about these issues. They're going to each come out and do their moment of about five to seven minutes. And then I'll bring them all back out together. We'll, we'll um, have a moderated discussion on some of these issues and how they're impacting our lives. So without any further ado, please put your hands together for Piper. We're standing here in front of the old Oakland auto plant. What was once a source of employment for many Oakland residents is now a crime scene. Witnesses say that an Oakland police officer shot a man across the street from this plant. The man then returned fire, wounding the officer and managed to escape into the plant. Witnesses then say that the officer gave chase and neither the man nor the officer have emerged from the plant since. <clears throat> now, what we have here is a blatant example of police Terrorism at its worst. You see, instead of serving and protecting, they are murdering and neglecting those that they should be most obligated to serve and protect. Okay, you know, I mean, you're talking about a people that spend more time and energy trying to take down a flag, a flag of heritage in American history, has nothing to do with race, heritage and history, read a book. They spend more time and energy trying to take down that flag than they do raising their own children. God damn it! Johnson, Taylor, you get your asses in here. I wonder if they on that goddamn suspect. He's gotta be on parole, probation. All his priors, he shot a fucking cop. He didn't just start his career today. You know, I wouldn't give a damn if all he did was steal a bag of chips. I want it, I want to spin it, and I want to get it to that bitch journalist immediately. She's killing us out there. And Taylor, make sure she knows about all the community policing we're doing around here. Fucking programs for kids and soccer and shit. Back to jail. <laughs> I grew up in jail. I was born with a with an umbilical cord wrapped around my wrist. <laughs> Fluid in my lungs, so I couldn't say shit. <laughs> I 
He should have just let me die. <laughs> what kind of sick motherfucker saves a life just to kill it a thousand times? <laughs> See, my mama's mama was my mama. See, her daughter, she, she was just Tamika. And my father was everybody and nobody. Top ramen and malto meal. Shit, now or later, I can't sit still. My mama said I'm special, and that's why I was in special education. <laughs> Teacher taught me how to get in line and shut up. She said, that's how I knew I didn't need school because she already knew how to get in the welfare line and shut up with the police talking to me. No, oh, fuck that. I got hatred walking through me. Bubbling to the surface, dripping from my lips like vomited venom. This is the vernacular of a virgin who has never known love but fucks the world every day in every way. Morier. <laughs> you, you stupid to pull, pull a gun on me. You got two rounds in you. Point blank range. You'll come out soon. You, you're gonna bleed to death. Hey, what, hey, what, Marie? You rather die, to, die to go back to the pen? At least, at least in the pen, you you got options, right? Thank you. Let's give it up again for Piper. He's giving us an excerpt of this piece called Cops and Robbers. Um, next we will have Hassan, Hassan, um, who's an interdisciplinary artist working with issues in surveillance, privacy, migration, citizenship, technology, and the challenges of borders. His work is frequently in the media and has appeared on Al Jazeera, Fox News and on the Colbert Report. He is currently Associate Professor of Art at the University of Maryland, ranked the number one most militarized university in the US by vice.com, and equidistant from the CIA, FBI, and NSA headquarters. Please put your hands together for Hassan. Thank you, Carlton. Thanks for having me here. Man, that's, Piper, that's gonna be a tough one to follow after you. But uh, thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, so I'm Hassan, I'm an artist. And uh, often when I tell people I'm an artist, you know, often the first question I get is, well, what, what, what kind of art do you make? And I get called all sorts of things. I get called like a photographer, sculptor, a media artist, con artist, I mean, you name it. It kind of goes through all. The, but you know what, I'm, I'm perfectly okay not having to qualify that term. I'm perfectly okay with just using the term artist. And I really, I really like to think about, uh, like, I think the business that we're in is kind of a creative problem solving and we come up with different ways of solving problems and come up with hopefully the most creative way about it. So I had a little bit of a problem a few years ago. So, you know, Hassan, Muslim, uh, the guy, you know, brown guy, shortly after 9-11, I got reported as a terrorist. And uh, basically, you know, I was coming back from, the, from overseas and the, got taken into the airport and then all sorts of lovely things. I spent six months of my life justifying every moment of my existence to the FBI, trying to tell them, look guys, I'm not a terrorist. And uh, so basically, uh, you know, it's, it's just went on and on and on. It's one of those things, it's like, you know, so there was a report that there was an Arab man who fled who was hoarding explosives on September 12th. And never mind, it wasn't the 12th, never mind, I'm not Arab. But you know, all those you know, brown guys, they're kind of all the same kind of thing. If you see something, say something, even if you only see it in your head, and you're just kind of like making it up. So, uh, yeah, so I had a little bit of an issue. So, at the, uh, so basically, after six months, it all ended uh, with uh, nine consecutive polygraphs in one setting which is kind of interesting that you can't use polygraphs in court, but uh, the FBI uses it for terrorism-related uh, things. 
And I think anyone that talks to me for more than a couple of minutes realizes I'm not exactly a terrorist threat, but once you're looped into this mess, you're never actually getting out of it. Uh, it always kind of hounds you forever. So um, at the end of this whole thing, the FBI agent that, I, that was dealing with me, my FBI agent, he walks in and he's like, hey, everything's okay, everything's great. I was like, yeah, I know, that's what I've been trying to tell you guys all along. Uh, can you guys give me a letter saying everything's okay? And there's a little problem here because uh, the way our judicial system works, uh, it's really hard to be not guilty of something you never did because it was never within the law, it was all extrajudicial. So I said, guys, um, I travel a lot. Uh, all we need is the next guy at the, nec at the next airport not to get this memo and here we go all over again. How do I, how do I avoid this? How do I avoid further altercations? And uh, at that moment, my FBI agent said, here's some phone numbers, give us a call, we'll take care of it. So ever since then, I'd always call him and say, hey, I gotta go. He said, okay, where are you going? Oh, I, I'm going to Tokyo, okay, what's your flight numbers? Uh, Continental 8 coming into Houston on this day. Okay, no problem, I got it. And then a few weeks later, I'd call him up again. And then uh, I'd be like, where are you going this time? Okay, I gotta go to this thing in Frankfurt. Okay, what's your flight numbers? It's not because I had to, but I chose to. I voluntarily decided to preempt the whole action and say, you know what, guys? Here's where I'm going. Here's, no, I don't want you to make it look like I'm running off or raising any red flags. Just letting you know this is what I'm doing. So basically, this went on and on, and the phone calls turned to emails, and the emails got longer and longer and longer to like, you know, like really long with lots of pictures, and I was telling them where I was hanging out, giving them travel tips, and it's like, hey, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Cambodia this week. Uh, the beaches are really nice. The food is great. Uh, you should consider a vacation here. You know, they like Americans now. Uh, you know, all these little things, and he would always write back, thank you, be safe. <laughs> so it was a really, really, really unbalanced relationship. You know, here you think you're, not, you're like telling somebody your whole life story and every little detail, and you think they're actually listening to you, and it's like, thank you, be safe. So it's like this, and I was like, wait, wait a minute, what? I, I'm gonna tell you like everything, and that's all you, you're only gonna give me four words? So I felt a little hurt. And then I started thinking to myself, wait a minute, why is it this guy, why is it this FBI agent is so special? And why is it only that he gets to know everything about me? So, you've been looking at these pictures, so what I basically did, this is way before the, I guess, you know, the, I guess these days it would be called an app, but back then, this was 14 years ago that I started this, the word app didn't even exist in the way that we use in the common language today. And what I did, basically decided, I took my old school Nokia 6600, not so smart smartphone for back then, and I basically turned it into a tracking device. And basically I started like reporting in where I was at what point. Uh, so you can see these are all the grocery stores I've visited around. You can see you know, the food that I eat. This I got on this, uh, th there was this uh, train over here. You can get, oh, actually that was, that was a boat. Or on May 1st I was at this airport getting on this plane. So I was like telling my FBI agent, look, I couldn't have been involved in that attack because I was at this place at this point at this time. And people thought I was crazy. 14 years ago, people were like, why do you want to tell everybody what you're doing? Why do you want to give them a map to where you are? And then interestingly enough, you know, like not even, not even just a few years later, it's become so commonplace that we're all kind of doing this. You know, it's kind of interesting. I talk to some of my students, they're like, well, this, I don't get it. This looks like my Instagram feed, you know? <laughs> so if you think about it, here's the interesting thing. So in, right now, there are uh, roughly one and a half billion users on Facebook alone. And so at 1.5 billion, I mean, that is, that's the world's largest country. There are more people on Facebook than the population of China. And once you factor that in, that that's roughly one in six, one in seven of the world's population, once you start factoring that in, how many of those people have access to clean, a clean uh, water or access to education or even access to reliable electricity? The fact that there's more people that are on Facebook globally sharing their information than, on, than basically access to education. I mean, that's kind of frightening. So the reality is basically I've come to this realization. It's like, guys, you guys want to watch me? I'm perfectly okay with that. But I can watch myself so much better than you guys ever could and I could get such a level of detail that you'll never have access to. So basically, this is, this is where this project starts. So I've shared 80,000 images with the FBI and you, and uh, you can go online and see the exact same thing that the FBI sees. Uh, but here's an interesting thing. So intelligence agencies, and it doesn't matter who they are, but they all operate in, in an industry where their currency is information. And the restricted access to the information is what makes it valuable. So, Basically, because no one else can access the, my FBI file, the FBI files, well, that's, it has value. 
But if I borrow the simplest, form, sim simplest principles of economics and flood the market to the point where I just basically bypass the middleman and just give you all my information, then the information that the FBI has has zero value, and thus it devalues their currency. Now, I realize on an individual basis this is purely symbolic, but if 300 million people were to start doing this, it would force an entire restructuring of the way we categorize and we collect information, and I think this is a huge shift that we need to do. So I'd like to uh, wrap it up with the thing is, we need to rethink what the idea of privacy means and what privacy meant at, a, at, at an era in the past. It is no longer about that. It's no longer about having access, it's no longer about having the information, but it's actually about the analysis of the information and what that means. So with that, thank you very much, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, next, we will have Shinyeri Tatashuna, who works for the Center for Media Justice, uh, who's a policy advocate on issues of media, uh, and she's going to talk to us about some of the work that she's been doing around predictive policing. Okay. Hello, everyone. How y'all doing today? I'm responsive. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to kind of go back and forth to just want to be transparent. So my name is Chinyeti Tutashinda. I work for the Center for Media Justice, um, home of the Media Action Grassroots Network. Lots of acronyms there, but <laughs> we essentially do media um, and policing technology surveillance policy work, right? And outside of that, I'm an organizer. I'm an organizer um, that's really active here in the Bay Area and throughout the country with the Movement for Black Lives um, and understand not just firsthand, but historically what surveillance has meant for our communities, right? So I come from Oakland, home of the Black Panthers, <laughs> and have known since I was a really young person then that at one point in time, the Black Panthers were the number one targeted um, group in the country, right? They were Operation Zero, all eyes on them, and the FBI went in intentionally targeting, surveilling, infiltrating in order to break them up. And we understand as a black person and as people of color that this is not the first time this has happened. That the government has always used whatever apparatus and technologies were available at the time to survey our communities, to imprison us, to watch us from fugitive slave laws to internment camps, to be able to have eyes on us when they wanted to, right? And then fast forward in 2013, Edward Snowden released a set of documents that proved that the NSA is not just watching us, but watching everybody, <laughs> every phone call, every text message, every email, everything from everyone in this country. And in the privacy world and security world, people are like, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. And it was, but for us and for the communities that I'm a part of, we're like, well, duh, <laughs> welcome to the club. Like we've known this, right? Um, and they are many tools that they have used in the past and now with the 21st century, they have introduced new tools, right? And these tools are a little different in the ways in which they are targeting our communities now. Um, and I'm gonna talk about two in particular. So one is the idea of predictive policing. Who in here has seen Minority Report? Yes, a lot of us, right? And we saw it, and this came out almost 15 years ago, and you're watching like, oh my God, you have precogs who are like deciding, oh, the future is here, this crime happened, and we're gonna stop it before it happened. And now we have technology that is doing something really similar. They're taking this huge amounts of data, huge, huge, huge amounts of data of where crime has happened, who has committed crime, um, where it might happen again, and putting it into this, into algorithms and into computer software that then tells police officers, actually, you should go here because this is where crime is going to happen again. Now, when I first heard of that, the thing that kind of struck me the most was, well, I can tell you where crime might happen. <laughs> I've lived in communities. I don't necessarily need data to tell me that, <laughs> right? And I know even more than where it's happening, I know where you think it's gonna happen, right? Because one of the problems with it is that we take old data, data that relies on humans, data that's relied on 
really systematic structures and racial structures that have set up that have over-policed our communities. We know there have been studies and studies and studies that have talked about the over-drug use that happens in white communities, yet the people who get arrested and over-policed for drug use are communities of color. So if we're taking in that data and using it to say, well, this is where crime is going to happen, it's going to give us the same results. And the problem with that is twofold, right? So outside of the fact that they now have all this information on us, is that you have millions and millions of dollars going into these programs. Millions of taxpayer dollars that are going in from the um, Department of Justice, millions of like city dollars with very little oversight and very little proof that these programs work. And are continuing to then be able to say, and police officers can say, and departments can say, well actually, you know, the program said this is where it was gonna be, it wasn't me. And looking at how they're taking the individual and being able to then say, well, data is neutral. And what we know is that it's not. It's informed by humans, it was created because humans then created the data, and this math then is going to give us the exact same results that we've always gotten, right? So that's a little bit about like what predictive policing is and why it's bad. The other technology that I think that people really need to know about are stingrays or IMS catchers. So here's a little bit about what they do. So right now we are a community, we are a group who is here. Outside across the street in a van, there could be a device. And it would get the cell phone information of every single person in here. It can track all of your contacts, it can get all of your call records, it can get all of your text messages instantly without permission, right? And there's nothing we can do about them. And police departments across the country have them, use them, and won't tell us about them. So I say all of this not to scare you, not to be like, oh my God, it's really freaky, which it is, but more importantly to say that we need to know. As artists, we need to know. As activists, as communities of color and as impacted communities, we need to know the tools that are being used against us. We need to be able to know because we need to be able to protect ourselves. And right now, organizations like mine, the ACLU, there's a wonderful group down in LA, um, Stop LAPD Spying, that are saying, how do we get more communities of color and more organizers and more activists to be aware of this because it's hurting us. And it's not just the people that want to keep everything private and use the, the guise of we're fighting terrorists or we're fighting the criminals and understand that those eyes are on us. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> I want to bring all the panelists back to the stage so that we can have a conversation. Uh, I was rushing through all of my intros because I was more interested in us having the conversation uh, than you hearing me talk and tell you what you've already got in your program book. So um, I have a few questions to kind of get everybody started. I want to start with Piper. Um, as an artist that has witnessed firsthand the effects of police brutality in your community, uh, speaking specifically about the Oscar Grant uh, situation, how did you make the decision to work in law enforcement and how does your art uh, and your creative practice inform the way that you um, work as, a, as an officer? Well, I had thought about it a couple times, but the Oscar Grant situation <clears throat> basically gave me the boost and was the defining situation for the most part. Um, I went to San Francisco State. I got a degree in black studies. I have fantastic professors. I had a great education in high school. My mother educated me before that on what it means to be black in this country. And then growing up during the crack epidemic, you know, provided more information. But going to that uh, first protest at the Fruitville Bar Station, and uh, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of people there. And I just remember being hurt and passionate and wanting justice, whatever that meant. And Talking to everyone there, I remember I was interviewed, it's on the internet, and talking to everyone there, we wanted to get rid of the bad cops. The cops that you know, didn't care about our community, or were racist, or uh, were brutal for no reason, or made stops for no reason. We wanted to get rid of them. But then the thought crossed my mind, if we could identify all of them, first of all, and then get them fired or indicted, get rid of all of them, who's gonna replace them? because 
I knew that I wouldn't. I knew that none of my friends would. And I looked at everybody's face that was at that protest, and I couldn't imagine anyone there doing it. And the protests look exactly like this auditorium, this theater right now. Different races, uh, genders, whatever. So, you know, it became clear that if, if nobody that thought like us or had the education that we had or just watched that movie or just read that same book, if nobody like us was willing to go in and replace the bad cops, it's an incredibly high probability that uh, someone that thinks like them is going to replace them. So even if Darren Wilson gets indicted, who replaced him? Who replaced Meserly? Who got hired in his place? Because he left a vacancy, you know? And that kind of haunted me for a year. And then like a year later, I had the opportunity. My band had been touring in Europe and we, we had a lot of success. But you know, my friend, my singer, the friend of mine, he got on drugs and we knew we couldn't tour. We were just making music to license it. So I was gonna be home. I knew I was gonna get a job for a couple years, but I still didn't think they would hire me. But I found out that I could pay my way through the academy. So I said, you know what? I've been talking all this shit. I've been on stage in India, rocking the crowd in India about what's going on in Oakland. Nobody in Oakland got my band's album. The police in Oakland ain't listening to it. I'm rocking India though. I'm rocking Germany. I'm rocking Ohio State. <laughs> and artists know that. When you go out on stage, you rock in people for the most part that are not the demographic that you wrote the material for if you're from the conscious community. I said, I'm at least gonna pay my money and go into the academy. And if I get kicked out, because I'm all over the internet talking crazy. If I get kicked out because of that, so be it. At least I did what I was, what I was supposed to do. I end up graduating and, and giving a commencement speech at the end of the academy. So I've been in there for about five years, working hard, and it's been the best education that I could have gotten, you know, second to the San Francisco State. Appreciate it, appreciate it. Someone has to step up into those roles, right? You know, and, and if we're not uh, in actively involved and engaged, and, and part of that is like that stigma between, um, you know, it's the us versus them, and who wants to be, you know, part of the cops because they've terrorized our communities and neighborhoods for so long. So, right. you know, it's a very interesting and important distinction to make in terms of taking the accountability and putting yourself in that space to to be a part of your community in that way. Um, Hassan, since mm -hmm. since you began this project of what I'm calling hyper self surveillance. Um, <laughs> Are you Aggressive running into compliance. Yeah, compliance? Aggressive compliance. Aggressive compliance. <laughs> yeah. um, are you are you running into um, ways that surveillance is being used now that um, that surprises you? Or um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about the Apple encryption yeah. case and what those things mean. Yeah, you know, there's always a lot of details that are left out when we hear about some of the things. So Chinir, you're talking about these, how the NSA and the Snowden. Things. Well, one of the things uh, that we very quickly forgot about was that in 2007, literally right around the corner from here, right at 2nd and Folsom, is AT&T's data center. Uh, Hawkeye is their internal name for it. And uh, in so prior to 2000, sometime between prior to, sometime prior to 2007, the NSA approached 16 telecom companies and said, we'd like to copy a data stream. And 15 of the 16 said, sure, be our guest, help yourself. Uh, the only company that objected to that uh, quest uh, no longer exists, by the way. Uh, they said, you know, we're not really sure about the legalities of this. Please come back with a warrant and we'll give you what you're looking for. So I think this is a really interesting thing about, like, that was, what, seven years ago uh, or eight years ago. And now, and then, and then we see this, uh, the, the, the papers from Snowden, we're all shocked. It's like, wait, didn't we just see that? Right. that this is what's going on. So I think this is the thing that we keep, we keep forgetting. I, mean, I think we have very short-term memory about this. And I think that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit of a problem in terms of how we run across these, these types of things. Now, in my case, I've, just, you know, I've decided just to open it all up. Right. And I've just decided to put everything out there. I figure if they're gonna have the information, well, why don't we just put it, why don't we just put it to everybody? You've done a preemptive strike. It's exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think what also happens, it's all opting in. Right. And that's actually an ultimate, that's really is an incredible form of power is when you opt in on your terms. But the other thing that's also happening is, as I'm telling you all this stuff, as I'm giving you all this information or telling the FBI, and you, and you saw the kind of material that I'm putting out there, um, it's very hard to decipher which one of this is, in, what piece of information is valuable and which information is useless. So what it really is, is this idea of like living in, uh, in hiding in plain sight or, or, or camouflage. His, uh, uh, data camouflage. You know, historically, the camouflage. Uh, with, you know, we t we tend to think of warfare 
and soldiers would wear specific patterns, so therefore the enemy could not distinguish between the soldier and the landscape right. of warfare. But the interesting thing is when you look at the new camouflage that the, our troops are wearing now, and it's this pixely, greenish, grayish type of thing, there's no trees that color anywhere. <laughs> and there's no blocky, pixely trees. No, th what that's meant for is so the enemy cannot distinguish between the soldier and the noise and the night vision goggles. So we have this huge shift now where in the past we had to, uh, we had to uh, be in the landscape of warfare, but now we have to embed it and the machinery is embedded. And now it's about how do we distinguish our bodies from the, from the data noise and the artifact. Wow. Right. That's, um, that's a lot. That's a lot to think about. Um, you know, Shinyeri, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, all the things that you talked about in terms of predictive policing. Um, what is this, you know, what is this doing in terms of, like, uh, how does this changing the landscape of, of activism? We saw, like, these militarized systems roll out on protesters in Ferguson. We saw, you know, things that were used in battlefields in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, supposedly for the war on terror being turned against civilians in our own communities. Um, you know, civilians that look like us, not regular mm -hmm. civilians. But um, how, what is that? How is predictive policing and, and this, this hyper um, racial profiling, how is that playing out? I mean, I think it's, play, it's playing out in a couple of ways, right? So predictive policing, although I talked about it um, a little bit here, it did start. It started in the battles in Afghanistan and Iraq um, in order to find out which um, like combatants they were going to go after, what neighborhoods, and then they, they are putting that here. One of the things that we've seen within like organizing communities is the use of the same tools. So stingrays, there started to be reports about a year and a half ago where people were like, well, I'm at an action or at a protest and my phone just doesn't work anymore. And one of the things that as stingrays, um, as the devices are collecting information um, and as they start to target then who they want to, it blocks everyone else from the cell tower. And it doesn't do it permanently, but you'll notice you're there and all of a sudden you have no signal. And it comes back within like 30 seconds or so, but you're like, what happened in between that, right? And there are reports that like the New York um, NYPD has used it several times at actions in the last two years. You have um, reports of even Oakland most recently who has a, it's called, I think it's like Geosphere, which is a program just to be able to mine social media, right? And you have people at different <coughs> protests and actions who are being called out by their Instagram names or by their Twitter names, which shows right there that they are not only just following you, but they're tracking it, right? And you have people who are from various communities, like I have friends who've gone and were in Baltimore who are being called out by Baltimore police departments by their Twitter names. Right, the showing just the ways in which it's being used, and there's so much that we don't know right now. So currently, Color of Change has started a FOIA project, um, a Freedom of Information um, project, really working with people within the movement for Black Lives to be able to get as much information about not just the big actions that have taken, big actions and protests that have taken place, but also individuals, individuals that are in the limelight and in the media, and those who are also doing work behind the scenes to be able to find out. And what we're finding, and anyone who's done FOIA requests know it's a long process, is that there's a lot of blocks. It's a lot of like, well, we can't give you that. You actually need to go to this department, or you need to go to this department. Not saying we don't have information on you. It's around who do you need to go to to be able to get the information. So we know that they're using these tools, um, and we know that they're, they're collecting data. That's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, it's changing the landscape of activism, right? Um, and so, but this, this, it's always been this idea out there of people who are advocates for, you know, don't see any problem with this to say that, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, then you ain't got nothing to worry about. Like, how do you feel about that? Like, what, what, is that, what does that mean? Like, That's not true. It's not true. And uh, I've always known it's not true, but I, I actually learned firsthand people always ask me what's the most racist thing I've seen since I've been in law enforcement. And it was right after I finished the street program. And I, I made it out to the streets and I told myself, I'm going to knock on every door in the community that I police, because I want to meet everybody. Because I believe knowing people is like, you got to do the majority of the work before the confrontation even happens. Because then the confrontation likely won't happen. Uh, I'm knocking on doors, I'm going to different apartment building complexes, speaking to apartment building managers, tenants, and the next day, 
uh, an email went out to everybody on patrol that a black male in his 30s had stolen a uniform and was impersonating a cop. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and this is, this is, I mean, we, this is, <laughs> This is, in, this is in the Bay Area. This is in San Leandro, 2013. So I, I, don't, I don't know what's happening in Ferguson or Arizona, because that happened in the Bay Area in 2013. And I really, it took me 30 minutes to write the reply to that email. I mean, the, the woman that did it, white woman, late 20s, early 30s, uh, you know, she's, she's not just an apartment building manager. She probably serves on a jury. You know, she's looking over applications. Who's going to live here? You know, she's probably, she's an average American, mm -hmm. just like cops are average Americans, just like teachers are average Americans. And just going into law enforcement was a profound education on the mindset of an average American because they're the ones that call the police when they're scared. So you see what they're afraid of, you know, and you begin to learn the language over the radio. and You begin to learn what's going on and, 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 and why like the situation in Cleveland where the brother's uh, looking at the, the replica AR-15 in like Walmart or something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he gets shot up. If you look into, listen to the 911 calls, the callers are saying, there's a black male in here pointing a machine gun at everybody. Callers, plural. They look at the tape, he never once pointed it at anybody. Police came in, confirmed that he still pointed the weapon. A firm, went in, dropped the gun, he turned around, they lit him up. And it's like, it's just, uh, it goes from the police are sick. The major, the dominant culture within law enforcement is sick. It goes from that to America's sick. And it's in your face on a daily basis. There's a sickness and, and it's fluorescent. And you can see it everywhere because you're the one that's supposed to deal with it. Wow. So no, if you're not doing anything wrong, you still may have something to worry about. That's the day I stopped telling brothers to pull their pants up. <laughs> so speaking of that, it's like that's a really good um, segue into trying to understand how predictive policing, how you know, uh, creating these mass surveillance states and communities, how was that playing into roles of, of property rights and human rights like gentrification, which I know San Francisco and, and Oakland are going through some huge transitions right now. Like how is that, how is that playing out here? I think that so what's interesting is like the use of technologies, right? So predictive policing and predictive sentencing and all that are like one brand and like one batch of t policing technologies, right? But you have all of these different ones that add up that give us the results, right? And the results are overcriminalization, um, the mass incarceration actually rising, not depreciating, um, and over policing, but this time without being able to, to say that it wasn't us, right? And what you see, so that's happening in like the police world, local, state, federal, kind of all the way up. And then what you have on the citizen side is an example of like these, the deputizing of citizens to be able to then survey their communities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you, that's always, they've always been a back and forth. So even when we look at like historically, you had slave patrols and, um, fugitive slave laws that then deportize regular citizens to be able to say if they saw any black person who didn't, who looked suspicious at the time or was not where they were supposed to be, to be able to capture them and enslave them because they now were deputized. And what you see is the use of technologies to do that today. You have apps like Nextdoor where you have communities writing and talking about each other. You have suspicious activity reports where nothing has to be happening. You can just call because something just doesn't feel right, right? And that happens in the Bay. There's apps that are similar to that in New York. There's whole websites that are around like Ghetto Raider where you can go on and rate your neighborhood and be able to see if that's a place where you want to live based on how ghetto a neighborhood is, right? And these aren't, these aren't policing sites. These aren't tools that, although police do interact with them, they're not set up for them. They're set up for average citizens being able to then survey their neighborhoods and survey their communities. And what you're finding is that you have people who are going into communities that they are not used to, they are not from, have not fully become a part of, and then are surveying everyone else and are scared, and you have that average American who grew up watching 
the, the, the news every night who grew up with these ideas of what does it mean to be a person of color? What does it mean to be black or Latino? What does it mean to be an undocumented person or an immigrant? And they're, that's playing out in these sites. So, you know, we've been in the news lately. What has been in the news lately is uh, this iPhone yeah. encryption case. And, um, and uh, of course, we're in iPhones, you yeah. know, Apple's somewhere, somewhere around here. <laughs> uh, they're building, like, um, the mothership of all buildings. Yeah, right um, on 280. Yeah. yeah. So, that's, uh, so tell us about th that encryption case. Yeah. You know, this is an interesting thing because on the outside, you know, it's, it seems as if, Apple's like, no, no, this is, this is for privacy and such. And we've seen on the Snowden Papers that Apple joined the PRISM program in October of 2009. Mm -hmm. So, oh no, sorry, October two, uh, 2013. So it's not necessarily something that's relatively new. We have proof that Apple actually has been cooperating with the NSA. Uh, now, interestingly enough, the, there's, a little, there's a little detail that's left out of when we have this conversation about this Apple iPhone is that the iPhone that's in concern with, San, with the San Bernardino shooter is that it's a government-owned phone. It is his work phone, it is not his personal iPhone, and the shooter's job was that he was a medical inspector for San Bernardino County. So therefore, the phone that's in consideration is a government-owned phone that has medical records on it. So therefore, it has I mean, you want, you want your medical inspectors to have encrypted data. You don't want just that information going to anybody. So there is some usefulness to this encryption. So, so, the, so that part is very conveniently left out about the fact that this is a government phone with medical records. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now it's like, it's okay to, like, no, it's like, no, no, it's, let's pay no attention to that. We just need to get in and, and, and Apple's putting up this. Light. And of course, at the end of the day, it's, this, is, this benefits Apple financially to say, hey, we care about your privacy, even though there's papers that clearly show that Apple has been involved in this conference. So this is one of the things. And, and also another thing to keep in mind is that how, how uh, we generally tend to think of surveillance as you know, this old school model of like being followed around and things. And that's easy, that, that may be easy to spot, but a lot of the stuff happens underneath that we just don't even see because it's not, it's not necessarily physically tangible. I don't know, do we have time to go into the into the phone things? But maybe maybe we can do that a little bit we'll later. Do, we'll end with that. Okay, let, we, we can do that. And I, I want to show you something that might totally freak you out about, like you know, how, and maybe how not. things. And maybe not. Maybe you're like, okay, yeah, well, you know, I mean, I know that this is this is what I do all the time. Yes. So the reason why you know I, I spoke to Kristen and Roberta, and I was really uh, it was really important to to have this conversation here, you know, and this is, isn't necessarily just about the arts, but it is about what is the response, how do people, how does the, 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 the powers that be stay in power when everything around them is changing? Uh, and this is one of those ways in which um, the, the, the government, those entities, corporations, are, um, you know, using data and information to, um, to justify all types of things. Um, and so the question that I would like to just lay out there is, um, is this the new normal? Is this what life will be for us moving forward? Um, and or are there uh, ways to disrupt that? Is, are there ways to think about how do we uh, figure out ways to um, slow down the, 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 the developing surveillance state? Yes, <laughs> is the first part. <laughs> Not only is it the new normal, it's been the normal for a while, right? right? Yeah. What we're finding is that we're learning about some of the newer technologies, but that doesn't mean they haven't been used, right? right? And it's, getting, it's going to be getting worse. So we have, there are stingrays, there are the body cameras that point at us, not at the police. You have surveillance cameras everywhere, right? You have traffic cameras that not just can take a picture of you, but it takes your license plate, and you have traffic cameras in some cities on every single corner. So if it can take a picture of your license plate there, it can also follow that, right? So there's so many ways in which we're being surveyed. There are drones um, that are being used by police departments that can come in and take sw pictures and swarms of whole neighborhoods. And they're getting smaller. Like I just saw a report the other day that talked about bug drones. And they're the size of bugs that can fly into your house, take pictures, at some point, you can probably weaponize them, and you would never know what happened, right? We've all seen the movies from 
you know, when I asked around like Minority Report, that's real, and that was 15 years ago. You have movies like Enemy of the State that talk about the ways in which cameras can follow you around, and that's now, mm -hmm. right? So yes, I think that it's the future. What I think that we can do, though, is start to demand accountability and start to demand transparency where there is none. Because po police departments are not required to tell us that they have them. The department, um, the feds are not required to tell us where they use them. And all of this is happening so secretly and so covertly that we're not paying attention. As organizers and activists, when it comes to like the fight around privacy, we've been so far away just dealing with I mean, for very good reasons, just the, the ability to survive and to live, but not understanding the ways in which this is impeding our survival. Um, and we have to pay attention and we have to get into this fight. Um, I would say ways to kind of slow that down outside of demanding transparency, encrypt, 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 encrypt everything. Everything that you can, encrypt it. Um, Make sure your phone is locked, right? So I was on a call the other day and one of the things, like iPhone, your standard lock is a four digit code. Change it, if you go in your privacy settings, you change it to a 10 digit one, it would take the machines eight years to be able to crack that code. Do it, it's 10 digit numbers, right? Which is just thinking about it as like a phone number. You used to know phone numbers, you can remember a 10 digit code, right? Um, <laughs> Make sure if you are an organizer or an activist, whether you are doing the most like peaceful, non-civil disobedience kind of stuff, use an app called Signal. It is free, you can make phone calls, you can text, you can send pictures, it is encrypted end to end and safe, right? There are tools out there that are here to protect us. So I would say to use them, utilize them, research them. There are organizations like the ones that I work on that are working on the policy end, but there are also organizations um, that work on the technology end and education. So we're here in the Bay Area, you have the Electronic Frontier Foundation, go to their website, they will give you so much information about how to protect yourselves in the digital world and using like digital surveillance. Thank you, so we're gonna end with uh, oh, yeah, yeah. A, a quick treat. So one of the things that we're talking about, so you know, talking about this thing of like surveillance systems, and, and we tend to really get caught up on cameras and pictures, but there are more cameras and people in this room right now, because every one of you have at least two cameras in your hand, one in the front and one in the back, and then never mind the surveillance cameras, and never mind, but why is it that we're also worried about our pictures being taken, because it's really the data that's underneath it. So why don't we do this thing where, Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, we're, we're getting the soundtrack. That's for us. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Moving right along. All right. So real quickly, uh, to, if you have an iPhone, do this. Uh, pu pull out your iPhones and go to your settings. Some of you may already know about this and you may already have this off, but for those that don't have it off, this, is, this might be a little bit of a shock. So go to your settings, go to privacy, uh, scroll down, uh, well, scroll up, sorry, into location services. Are you in location services? Go down towards the bottom, you'll see system services. Go into system services, and then scroll towards the bottom, and you'll see frequent locations. Do you see that? Go in it. And then go into each of those. <laughs> okay, so why should, a, why should a, a, a police agency or a government agency invest thousands of, of uh, people and following you around when mm -hmm. we can just pull that data right off of it. Your phone is your biggest spy. Yeah. Your phone is the biggest informant that there is. All right, anyway, so All right. thank you. <laughs> just a little fun to end the session. Um, please give a hand to our panelists. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, much needed conversation. Really appreciate you all and what you had to offer. And we're done. Thank we're you. gonna move on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And by the way, you can just turn your frequent locations off if that creeps Not you out. <laughs>